Ocarina of Time is deserving of its status as one of the best and most important games of all time. It single-handedly defined an entire genre for generations to come, the action-adventure game, one with an open world brimming with secrets and quests, a combat system that was both revolutionary and easy to understand, and a story as timeless as any work of art should strive to be. So imagine that you're Miyamoto or Aonuma at the time of Ocarina's release. Imagine how invigorating it must have felt seeing this thing you worked on resonate with so many people, but also how terrifying the prospect of making the inevitable sequel must be. Ocarina of Time's successor was always going to have to deal with the challenge of living up to massive, unrealistic expectations. So how do you top Ocarina's scale? How do you top its impact? How do you top something that's considered a masterpiece? That's the neat thing. You don't. Well, Miyamoto didn't think that it could be done, instead opting to stick to what everybody already loved and simply expanding upon it. He proposed Ocarina of Time's follow-up to be a second quest of sorts, the Ura Zelda project for the ill-fated 64 disk drive I brought up last time, which would remix the game's dungeons and other elements to offer players a fresh experience. Aonuma, on the other hand, wasn't very keen on going in this direction, especially since he felt that the game, namely its dungeons, were already as good as they could be. In asking Miyamoto for approval to begin working on something else instead, Eiji Aonuma not only positioned himself as director for a Zelda game for the first time in series history, but also became the catalyst for bringing the most dark, somber, and profound Zelda game into existence. One that I've adored since I first played it. This is The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Before landing on the Majora's Mask subtitle, the sequel to Ocarina of Time was codenamed Zelda Gaiden during development, the word Gaiden roughly meaning side story. The game was going to reuse Ocarina's engine and many of its assets, molding them to fit into a new adventure that would take place in a universe parallel to Hyrule, explaining why most of Ocarina's NPCs return with different names and roles. Now, why make a pseudo-sequel instead of something entirely new? Well, firstly, and understandably, the developers did didn't want to make an entirely new game engine from scratch because of how much time and work was put into Ocarina of Time's engine already. It's a practice that cuts development time and costs by a considerable margin and the reason why many games nowadays don't take ages to get made. Yet people still complain about this practice because it's human nature to bitch about things. And secondly, minimizing the time it would take to make a new Zelda game was the highest priority for Aonuma. Oh, Miyamoto definitely gave him the okay to make the game he wanted, on the condition that the project needed to be completed in one year. Sometimes I think that this man is evil, I swear to god. Even though this may make Miyamoto come off as some butthurt supervisor that didn't get his way, he with the help of Yoshiaki Koizumi not only wrote the game's story, but also came up with what would become the game's defining feature. Since the intention wasn't to make a full-fledged sequel, the number of total dungeons was shrunk in favor of a greater emphasis on side content, all operating within the constraint of an in-game time limit. Zelda Gaiden would employ a time loop mechanic where characters would adhere to a strict schedule based on the in-game clock to incentivize players to replay the game many times over, discovering new things and completing events in a different order each time. All of this and the promise of new dungeons, bosses, and these brand new transformation masks to spice up the base gameplay introduced in Ocarina of Time, Zelda Gaiden could have gone down as one of the biggest expansions in gaming history if it actually ended up being an expansion. So here's something that definitely didn't confuse news outlets and gamers around the time of the game's development. Zelda Gaiden was also initially designed as a 64DD expansion for Ocarina of Time, just like Ura Zelda. Miyamoto had to explain that the two were separate projects, but to this day I still see some confusion about what these expansions were, with some believing that the two were one in the same and that Zelda Gaiden was merely an evolution of Ura Zelda. So it was definitely for the better 
computer that Zelda Gaiden in its original state was scrapped and converted into a standalone N64 cartridge release, which we now know today as The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. To make the game more technically advanced than its predecessor, it was made to require the Nintendo 64 expansion pack, an accessory that gave the console an additional 4 megabytes of RAM. While the two games look very similar, Majora's Mask does look a tad cleaner. I think the texture quality and draw distance were some of the main things that were improved. Majora's Mask came out on April 27, 2000 in Japan, October 26th in North America, and November 17th in PAL regions. Six more days in the womb and I would have shared a birthday with the Black Sheep of the Zelda series. Yeah, so while Majora's Mask was well received by critics when it launched, the greater focus on side content, the game having fewer dungeons than Ocarina of Time, and the strict 3-day cycle, turned off more and more Zelda fans as the years went by. That is, until newer Zelda games came out that got similarly mixed reception from the player base shortly after they launched, prompting fans to re-evaluate Majora's Mask with it now being held high as one of the best entries in the series. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Zelda cycle. Happened with Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword. The gist of it is that opinions on Zelda games tend to shift drastically whenever a new one comes out or as time passes, with the modern exception being Breath of the Wild as it's pretty much remained a universal universally beloved entry for the past six years. Even still, Majora's Mask is a black sheep in the sense that it kinda sticks out. Aside from Breath of the Wild, it is the most different of all the 3D Zelda games. The game was missing many of the traditional Zelda elements fans had come to expect. We see Zelda in a flashback an hour into the game, and that's about it. The game consists of like 20% main story content and 80% side content, with a grand total of 4 dungeons scattered about in a land that isn't even Hyrule. The game is dark and isn't afraid to bring up serious topics like death and grief. And on top of all that, you have this whole time management system that the entire core of the game hinges upon, which also makes you deal with an unconventional saving method. When I first played this game after completing Ocarina of Time and not long after playing Skyward Sword, the most newcomer friendly entry in the series, I was incredibly intimidated and didn't like how anxious and stressed the game made me feel. Majora's Mask was just too complicated for me at that point. I felt there were too many moving parts for me to keep track of and the story hadn't gripped me enough to keep going. Three things happened that reignited my interest though. 1. Chugga Conroy's Let's Play in 2012. His enthusiasm always has a way of convincing me to try out games that I may have never tried otherwise. 2. I got into the Pikmin games and thoroughly enjoyed their time management system, which helped make Majora's Mask look more approachable. And 3. Ben Drown. I can't imagine a scenario where I make a Majora's Mask video and don't bring up Ben Drown. It's a very well written and entertaining ghost story and I don't think many people would get mad if I called it the best creepypasta of all time or if I say that it's the best by a wide margin. It's even more impressive when you learn about the way it was told through posts on 4chan by the author Alexander D. Hall aka Jaduzable and the videos that were posted to his YouTube channel as the story was being developed. If this is your first time hearing about Ben round, I recommend checking it out. It actually goes a lot deeper than I remember. The original story of the haunted cartridge is what I've mainly been talking about. I'm not very familiar with the other arcs of the story that were written later. This face used to scare the ever-living out of me though, more than anything I saw in any horror movies I watched. Yet, this creepypasta was one of the things that made me give Majora's Mask another chance, and ever since then, it's been in the upper echelon of my list of favorite Zelda games. After my first playthrough on the Wii Virtual Console, I joined the band of Zelda fans who were begging Nintendo to give Majora's Mask the Ocarina of Time 3D treatment. It's pretty funny looking back at just how long it took for Majora's Mask 3D to be officially announced and released considering that it was basically an inevitability. There were countless rumors and fake leaks, like this box art mockup that honestly looks better than the one we actually got since it matches Ocarina 3D's box art. We had to wait until the Nintendo Direct on November 5th, 2014, which opened up with a trailer confirming that the remake was a real thing. Iwata said it was coming out in spring of 2015 and it ended up launching on February 13th instead to coincide with the launch of the new 3DS XL in North America. Majora 3D was heavily featured in the promotion material for the new system. Playing the game on this new model would unlock full camera control thanks to the system's pathetic excuse for a second circle pad. Camera control can also be unlocked with the Circle Pad Pro accessory for the original models, but come on, you don't want to be called a poor bitch at school, do you? So, Majora's Mask 3D. 
There's a lot to go over. This is undoubtedly the most contentious of all the Zelda remakes. It changed a lot of things from the original. Some for the better, others arguably for the worse. All of the miscellaneous improvements from Ocarina 3D carried over to this game. Graphical facelift, the map, items, Ocarina, etc. being relegated to the bottom screen, gyro aiming, smoother controls for the most part, a faster text scroll, stereoscopic 3D, and the Sheikah Stone hint system are all back. The game now has full camera control for the first time, and is it just me or does this feel a little hacky? It's just weird seeing a 64 Zelda game with camera control, but it's definitely a welcome addition. Now here's where things get more interesting. Majora's Mask has always had a reputation for being inaccessible to players who are still fairly new to the series. In response to this, the 3DS version updated many of the original game's mechanics to make the game more beginner friendly, and in some cases it ends up dampening the experience, especially if you're a big fan of the original. The changes that bother me the most are the tweaks that were made to the controls of Deku Link and Zora Link. In the original, Deku Link's spin gives you a huge burst of speed on the fly, making these segments where you have to hop across water from lily pad to lily pad really fun. Zora Link had some of the most fluid swimming controls in any 3D game I've played. Just the right amount of speed and turning never felt clunky at all. In the 3DS version, they removed the acceleration boost you get from spinning as Deku Link. Getting that speed boost now is incredibly awkward to execute as it requires a running start, and Deku Link just takes longer to reach top speed in general because of this added windup to his running animation. The change unfortunately makes water skipping incredibly tedious now. And and the Zora Link swim is now bound to your magic meter. If you run out of magic or just don't want to waste any magic, you're stuck with this unexciting, slower swimming speed. It's not as slow as not holding the A button at all, but it's nowhere near as fast or exciting as the original Zora swimming. I guess it does make maneuvering tighter spaces easier, but you could always just walk if you felt that the swimming speed was too hard to control previously. At least I can sort of get why the change was made, even if I think it wasn't implemented very well. Unlike like the change to the Deku Link spin. I have no f***ing clue why they made it this way and can't defend it in the slightest. Some item placements and side quest rewards have been swapped around, which isn't really a big deal. The only one I wasn't a fan of was the new stone mass placement, mainly because I'm bitter from my first playthrough when I got to the pirate's fortress and didn't have enough magic to talk to the invisible soldier, because I wasted it all getting here now that magic is tied to the only swimming speed that's tolerable. I'm mixed on how the bosses were reworked. I don't like that they all have an obvious glow glowing eye weak point now like so many other lame bosses in the series. But fights like Yorg are a little better in my opinion thanks to a revamped second phase, whereas before I thought that this boss was pretty brain dead. On the other hand, Odalwa was never a very hard fight, but at least it was fun to experiment with how you wanted to defeat him as they made him vulnerable to many of your items. Now he just stares at you like a moron as you fly over him to drop a Deku nut on him to expose his weak point. And while I think that the change to the giant's mask is neat, making Link behave like a massive brute, the giant's mask is now required during the second phase of the twin mold fights instead of being optional like before, and the battle itself takes way too long now because of it. I remember stopping mid-fight on my first playthrough to look up online if I was doing something wrong. It really left a bad taste in my mouth. Other changes that initially look like improvements on paper still find ways to bother me a little. Deku Link has a completely new model and texture that is very detailed. It's technically an improvement, but why didn't the other Dekus in the game follow suit? They all still sport the same body texture they had in the N64 version. The bomber's notebook is now much more useful as a side quest and event tracker, and the bombers themselves now fill you in on rumors and hints for items and quests to keep an eye out for. But the game now pauses way too frequently whenever there's a new development in a questline, and it's annoying how these kids are just constantly up in your face now. And while I welcomed the visual overhaul for 99% of Ocarina of Time 3D, Majora's Mask really did benefit from the low poly, low frame rate look of the N64 version. It is a creepy game at its core, and making it look nicer does hurt its art style more than in Ocarina 3D's case if you ask me. Some minigames and other segments were dumbed down a bit too, like the Deku Butler race and flying over the palace garden. The first two days of the Deku Playground and Honey and Darling minigames, instead of rewarding you with rupees, now reward you with fishing hole passes that can be redeemed at the newly added fishing hole that I didn't spend a lot of time on because it's f***ing fishing in a 64 Zelda game. Also, they removed the rainbow staircase and made the number of total bottles uneven. 
yeah, f this game. No, I kid. I'm, I'm kidding, guys. I don't hate Majora's Mask 3D. I don't even dislike it. Some of the changes are legitimate improvements in my opinion. Having more save points is just better, I feel, and it helps break down the barrier to entry that is the game's intro. You now get the Sonata of Awakening a lot earlier, and the warping cutscene can now be skipped. The Song of Double Time now lets you skip to any hour of the day. Thank you. This cuts down on wait times for some quests by a noticeable amount. And even though I mostly prefer the original's more dated visuals, the final area made me question if it was actually running on a 3DS because of how gorgeous it looked. It's a very technically impressive game for the system. The bottom line is that which version you prefer will boil down to personal preference. I can't conclusively say which is the definitive version of Majora's Mask because there is no definitive version, which really sucks, and at this point, making a true definitive version of the game would be very difficult. Because what if someone likes the remixed bosses but wants to play with the original save system? Or what if someone wants to play the game just like how it was on the N64 but with the updated graphics, the new side quest and bottle, and the new Zora swimming controls because they're a f***ing maniac? If I had to pick which one's my favorite, I'd probably go with the N64 version. But then again, ask me another time and I may say I prefer the 3D version. I'd still say you're getting a fantastic game no matter which one you choose though. Majora's Mask starts with Link wandering around what is presumably the Lost Woods, looking for Navi after she ditched him at the end of the last game. His search is interrupted when he gets knocked off his horse by two mischievous fairies, following the orders of this Skull Kid wearing a strange mask. The Skull Kid robs Link of his horse and ocarina, prompting him to chase the thief down, leading him to a cliff that he falls off of, and he continues to fall for hundreds of feet, which we later learn transports him to the parallel world of Termina, a world where Link is helpless in his confrontation with the Skull Kid, who curses the hero and traps him in the body of a Deku scrub. With Link all alone and Epona nowhere to be found, the Skull Kid leaves, leaving one of his two fairies behind. The fairy, introducing herself as Tattle, commands Link to help her reunite with her brother Tail, promising to lead him straight to the Skull Kid for helping her. One reused twisted hallway later, Link finds himself inside a clock tower and is caught by surprise by the happy mass salesman from Ocarina of Time. The salesman doesn't explain how he got here, and his creepy ass smile and the way he instantly changes poses make him super suspicious, but he assures Link that if he can retrieve his ocarina from the Skull Kid, he'll help the young hero turn back into a human. In exchange, he also asks Link to bring him a mask that was stolen from him, the one the Skull Kid was wearing earlier, but that Link has to do all of this before the salesman leaves town in three days. You find out by exploring and talking to the residents of Clocktown, looking through the telescope in the nearby observatory, or simply from going into first person mode and looking up at the sky, that Termina's moon is slowly making its way toward the surface and will make contact in, you guessed it, three days. Three days! My feelings on Majora's Mask's intro are a lot like my feelings on Kingdom Hearts 2's intro. What do you know, that's the second time I've mentioned Kingdom Hearts in these Zelda videos. I used to not be a fan of either of these games' openings. In Majora's Mask's case, it's the start of a trend present in most 3D Zelda games after this where the openings are relatively unexciting, opting instead to spend more time setting the stage for the grander narrative and easing you into the game's world. Majora's Mask is unique in making Link the most helpless he'll ever be at the beginning of any of these games. Forcing the Deku form upon you in the first hour truly makes you feel powerless. A lot of Clock Town's residents ignore you and pay you no mind or just straight up won't allow you to do a lot of things. You aren't allowed to leave town, there's no enemies aside from the Skulchula and the sewers, and the game's time limit is forced on you right from the get-go. And in the N64 version, you can't even save because the Owl Statue save points can only be activated with a strike from your sword. So if you waste too much time and fail to find the Skull Kid, you have to do the whole opening all over again. Again. This is what makes or breaks Majora's Mask for a lot of people. Thankfully, I didn't find myself running out of time during the intro the first time I tried the game out, but the pressure I felt during those first three in-game days and knowing that it would persist through the whole adventure is what ultimately made me temporarily drop the game. The thing is, the intro is designed this way on purpose, and it took me a long time to fully grasp and appreciate how purposeful it is to the game's addictive gameplay loop and main appeal, its world and characters. Never before had a game forced me to talk to literally every NPC I saw. I had no choice. I, like Link, was completely lost. The only way to find the Skull Kid is by talking to Clocktown's residents for more information and putting the pieces together yourself, which in turn gives you the opportunity to get acquainted with them. Ocarina of Time's NPCs are charming to an extent, but it's not really worth talking to a good chunk of them, at least on repeated playthroughs, since a lot of them just spout superfluous nonsense. So it's impressive how majority 
Majora's Mask reuses so many of those original character models and manages to make them all more interesting. They have daily routines, actual personalities, and many of them are also dealing with their own problems in the midst of the giant space rock hovering above their heads. The intro not only does a great job of introducing you to the world and characters of Termina, it also does a great job of establishing the dread you'll feel during your adventure. Hate that the intro rushes you with the threat of the apocalypse slowly getting closer and closer? Good. That's the whole point, because dread is present in every corner of Termina, so you better get used to this game showing you some f***ed up sh But no matter what you do, even when you do find the Skull Kid and face him at the top of the clock tower during the world's final hours, you can't do anything to stop the unstoppable moon. Tail randomly brings up the swamp, mountains, ocean, and canyon and the four who are there, possibly alluding to a way of preventing the end of the world, but at this point, it's too late to do anything. If only there was a way to go back in time. After getting back his ocarina and playing the Song of Time to enlist the help of the Goddess of Time, Link and Tattle find themselves transported back to the dawn of the first day. They meet with the happy mask salesman again who pulls a giant piano out of thin air and teaches Link the Song of Healing, transforming him back into a human and containing the spirit of the Deku form in a mask. Unfortunately, Link didn't fulfill his end of the deal and the salesman doesn't take it very well. He pretty much confirms what you may or may not have gathered from your last encounter with the Skull Kid. The mask he's wearing is known as Majora mask. It holds an accursed power that could be used to bring about horrible destruction like Armageddon. You don't f***ing say. So it's clear at this point that the Skull Kid needs to be stopped at all costs. Tattle suggests going to the Swamp, one of the four regions of Termina that Tail mentioned earlier, and in terms of the main plot of taking the Skull Kid down, this is some of the last bit of story we get until the end of the game. The four who are there Tail referred to are these giants who serve as the four guardians of Termina. We find out that the Skull Kid used to be friends with them and turned to his mischievous ways after believing that the giants had abandoned him. His mischief only made the giants banish the Skull Kid for real, leaving him alone and friendless. And shortly after this is when Tattle and Tail found him and became his new friends. The pranks they played led them to steal Majora's mask from the happy mask salesman, kicking off the events of the game. With the mask's power, the Skull Kid cursed every part of Termina and sealed the four giants in the four temples so that there'd be nobody left to stop his doomsday plans. Everything I just summarized is delivered via one cutscene that plays not even a minute after heading in the direction of the southern swamp, the cutscenes that play after saving each of the giants, an optional side quest, and the ending. It's easy to write off Majora's mask narrative as being short and to the point with not much going for it, but the story is much deeper than it appears on the surface. Ocarina of Time tackles the harsh realities of growing up and the responsibilities that come with this unchangeable part of life, an aspect of the story I admittedly regret not sharing my thoughts on and forgot to praise in the last video. It's a part of the game that gets a good amount of attention in the main story, what with the time travel and Sheik's words of wisdom just before each temple. Majora's Mask is all about relationships and the human drive to keep moving forward even in the face of death, and it develops these ideas both during the main quest and in the multitude of side quests the game contains. Focusing on the main story first, as you run around Termina to free the giants, you'll explore the swamp to the south, the mountains to the north, the Great Bay to the west, and the ancient kingdom of Ikana to the east. The Skull Kid did a real number on these regions, ranging from poisoning the swamp water to making the home of the Goron suffer through an eternal winter. But what all of these places have in common is that the people of these regions are all suffering in some way as a direct cause of the curses on their homes. And I mean they're suffering, like Holy sh**. The Deku King's judgment has been clouded, believing that his daughter's disappearance is the fault of a monkey who in actuality was helping the Deku Princess's efforts to purify the poison swamp. Unfortunately for the monkey, he gets sentenced to death and is on track to being boiled alive. The Gorons are literally freezing where they stand due to the harsh winter, and their hero, the Great Darmani, recently passed away on his way to defeat the monster at Snowhead who has been terrorizing their village. Yet he is still roaming the land of the living as a spirit, bound to this road 
realm and unable to rest knowing that he has failed his fellow Gorons. The murky and dangerous waters of Great Bay have left Mikau, local guitarist and hero of the Zoras, on the brink of death after attempting to retrieve the eggs of his girlfriend and vocalist of the band Lulu that were stolen by some pirates, which has left her in a severe depression and made her lose her voice. Unlike Hyrule which only became doomed a third of the way through Ocarina of Time, Termina is f***ed as soon as you arrive. This is a broken world and only you can heal it. The problems the people of Termina face feel so real. Their dialogue and how they react to their situations feel so believable. It's what makes them stand out as some of the most memorable characters in the series and it's what makes you want to help them. You find yourself helping these people not just because you're being told to, but Majora's Mask succeeds in making you genuinely give a sh** about them thanks to its excellent writing. That's the most important thing that this game had to nail. It's a story about the end of the world, so make me give a shit whether this world gets saved or not. Make me care whether these characters live or die. And the heartbreak comes in those rare occasions where you're too late. But at the very least, you can do your best to carry on the wishes of the dead. Like Earthbound, the main appeal of Majora's Mask to me are the small moments you'll experience in your journey, like healing the troubled souls of Darmani and Mikau, witnessing Tattle become more fond of you, instantly giving her more of a personality than Navi ever had, plus she's just so snarky and I love that about her. A lot of people point out this part in Ikana Canyon where you heal this man from a curse that turned him into a Gibdo, reuniting a father and daughter in the process. It is a very touching and beautiful moment. But I think my favorite moment in the story is this one in Ikana Castle with the King of Ikana. To begin with, the entire Ikana section is my favorite part of the game, both in terms of gameplay and story, with the exception of one part that I'll bitch about later. They went out of their way to craft this whole backstory for the Ikana Kingdom that has little to no bearing on the main plot and can honestly be ignored if that's what you want to do. To sum it up, a great war between the Kingdom of Ikana and the Garo tribe started many years ago, and even in death, the soldiers continue to fight. The kingdom you explore in the game is one that has been ravaged by said war. It's a a wasteland with a bloody and dark history haunted by the dead due to the curse the Skull Kid placed on the region. In your mission to free the last giant, you also free the Ikana soldiers from a fight that should have ended long ago, allowing them to rest at last and you open the eyes of the Ikana King to the importance of friendship. Believing in your friends and embracing that belief by forgiving failure, these feelings have banished from our hearts. Friendships and relationships play such a vital role in what makes Majora's Mask so beloved. You can reach the end of the game by only completing the four temples, and you'll have definitely helped out a lot of people by doing that. But what about the rest of Termina? What about the troubled spirit of Kamaro who died before he was able to share his dance with others? What about the leader of the Gorman troop who lost passion in what he does and now drinks his sorrows away? What about the postman and his internal crisis, stuck between staying in town to do a job he's way too devoted to or seeking shelter before the moon crashes? What about the sisters Romani and Kremia, who will be left alone and distraught by the events of the previous days during their final moments if you don't do anything? Keyword, if. I can never bring myself to do a full playthrough of Majora's Mask without 100%ing it. Part of that is because of my own innate need to 100% most games I play, but this is the game that made me this way, I swear to god. I don't care how good the rewards I get are or what I'll get out of doing these quests in general. I 100% Majora's Mask because it's the right thing to do. Not just because you'll be missing out on most of the game's content if you skip the side quests, but because I feel like I'd be failing Termina if I didn't do them all. What good is saving the world if you leave it just as shitty as it was. Yeah, it does suck that technically all the work you do to help these characters gets reset whenever you play the Song of Time, but just look at the end credits. Everyone is acting as if you did their respective quest lines, so it makes me believe that, canonically, Link heals the entire world right before he saves it. These characters are so lovable that it's pretty much impossible for me to simply turn a blind eye and ignore their problems. Not every side quest resonates with me, but a lot of them do. I may as well get the big one out of the way first, the Anju and Cafe quest. This tale of the two star-crossed lovers is infamous in a way, due to all the steps required to complete it across a three-day cycle, having to do it twice to get every item, and for it being possible to mess it all up at the very end, but it embodies everything about what makes the side quests in Majority mask the best in the series. Seeing these two finally come together at the end, perfectly content with simply being with each other even in the face of impending doom, it just makes me feel so 
warm inside. It's all the reward I need. Anju and Kafei's relationship itself personifies this game's beauty perfectly. Hope and a desire for happiness in the middle of an otherwise hopeless situation. Finding Epona in the Romani ranch outside of Clocktown introduces you to Romani and Kremia. Doing the quests involving each of the two sisters prevents this depressing scene from playing out. You have to find a way into the ranch on the first day to learn from Romani that mysterious ghosts are coming later that night to steal the cows, and she asks you to help fend them off when they arrive. You not only save the cows and Romani by doing this, but you also unlock the quest with Kremia, where you accompany her as she makes a milk delivery to the bar in Clocktown. Completing the quest rewards you with a way into said bar but I simply enjoy learning more about the two sisters and the weight that Kremia carries, having to run the ranch pretty much single-handedly after their father passed away. I also love how this and many other quests in the game connect to other characters and storylines. It gives Clocktown and Termina as a whole this nice sense of community. This is where you learn about Anju and Cafe's unfortunate wedding date, encounter the conniving Gorman brothers if you didn't already meet them, and gain access to the milk bar that contains more interesting characters that you may not have met yet. Though why I'm the only one who needs to wear a f***ing cow head to get in is beyond me. I can't even begin to fathom how the Zelda team managed to create all of these interlinked side quests in such a short amount of time. Termina is one of my favorite settings in the entire series for this very reason. The NPCs in this game don't feel like they were placed randomly as a need to fill the overworld with generic people to talk to. Every character here has a purpose and a fully realized identity. I mean take Tingle, one of the most bizarre characters in the franchise who got his debut in this game. At face value, he may just seem like a weird 35 year old man with no other reason for being here other than to sell you maps. Then in the pictograph contest, you can submit a picture of Tingle to the Swamp Tourist Center guide and find out that Tingle is his son and learn about his embarrassment of him. They took these two characters who probably shouldn't have anything to do with each other and they made a whole backstory about them. Ocarina had its share of memorable characters and quests, but like, they just don't even compare to how layered Majora's world is. How expertly it combines its main quest and side content to craft one of the most intimate stories in the franchise. Which is why I can't be satisfied in beating this game without seeing this notebook completely filled. The characters are the heart of Majora's Mask, and they're why I love the story so dearly. But I mean, the story is only part of why I love this game. <laughs> Although Link's base abilities haven't seen much of an upgrade since Ocarina of Time, other than these cool new parkour moves and other small differences such as how he's able to hold a Hylian shield with one arm now, oh sorry, it's the hero's shield in this game. Really dig this design by the way, he now has new toys to play with in the form of masks. Masks are now an integral part of the game. Their usefulness varies, some aren't really needed outside of specific moments while others are more versatile, like the returning mask of truth from Ocarina of Time and the bunny hood which also returns from that game, which now doubles your running speed. I almost always have this thing equipped to one of my item slots. It cuts down on backtracking by a considerable amount and is just a joy to use. Lots of masks have uses that aren't immediately apparent, encouraging you to experiment and use them in various scenarios. The description of the stone mask says that it makes you become plain as stone, and wearing it makes Link virtually unnoticeable to a good chunk of the game's enemies, making sections like the Pirate Fortress a lot more manageable. The Bremen mask is used to lead these chicks during a side quest with a cute march and infectiously catchy song, one that the Econ of Swordsmen also seem to enjoy. Some masks like the Gibdo mask make Gibdos and Redeads non-hostile. Getting the Gibdo mask is unfortunately followed by my least favorite part of the game, this annoying trading sequence that requires you to have certain items in your inventory ahead of time if you don't want to leave and come back, which gives me flashbacks to the monkey cave from Earthbound. But not only is the Gibdo mask the reward you get after one of the game's most heartwarming moments, it makes Redeads do this. The Blast Mask is another one of my favorites. It's one of the first main items you can get after finishing the intro, now that you're capable of stopping the thief who tries to steal the big bomb bag from the bomb shop owner, because apparently stopping a young Deku scrub from leaving town is more important to this guard than stopping a literal criminal. Oh, you almost had it. 
You're gonna be quicker than that. The blast mask lets you blow your face up, essentially serving as an infinite use bomb with a cooldown. I just find it hilarious that the mask blows up while you're wearing it, yet you can somehow negate the damage if you put your shield up, which doesn't make any sense at all. This thing is awesome. I almost never use regular bombs because of it. But of course, these are all small fry compared to the transformation masks. There are five in total, the Deku Mask, Goron Mask, Zora Mask, Giant's Mask, and Fierce Deity's Mask, though the first three are the ones you'll be using the most, while the other two are restricted to certain parts of the game. These masks give Link various new abilities, expanding his options in combat and traversal in exciting ways. The Deku Mask transforms Link into a Deku Scrub. It's definitely the weakest mask transformation in the game and is kind of forgotten about after finishing the first dungeon, but some of its abilities are really fun to use, like the water skipping I mentioned earlier, as well as the Deku flower mechanic where you can dive into these flowers that launch you high in the air and let you glide across certain gaps. You can also drop Deku nuts while you're in the air, like if someone called a Hylian airstrike. On the ground, the spin attack is the only physical attack you have, but you do also have a snot bubble to attack enemies from far away at the cost of some magic. Thing is, Deku Link is definitely outclassed by the next two forms you unlock. The Goron Mask holds the soul of Darmani, transforming Link into the heroic Goron Warrior. You can punch the shit out of enemies and do a ground pound to take care of a small group of enemies and activate heavy switches. Given Link's size and strength in this form, he can push large objects and carry heavy items like the explosive powder kegs. The best ability you unlock as a Goron though is the Curl, where you can curl up into a ball to climb up steep slopes. And best of all, it makes traversing across the overworld an exhilarating experience once you reach top speed. It almost makes Epona a little worthless in this game. Goron Link is also somehow immune to lava and ice physics. Just try not to go near any large bodies of water. You'll sink like a rock. Then there's my favorite transformation mask, the Zora Mask, letting Link take the form of Mikau. As a Zora, you're a martial arts warrior, can use your fins as makeshift boomerangs, and have access to the smooth swimming controls I talked about earlier. There's nothing quite like exploring the ocean in such a graceful way, assuming you're playing the N64 version that is. Gosh, this is so stupid. They also had the genius idea of repurposing the iron boots from Ocarina of Time into the context-sensitive sync and surface commands, completely eliminating the need to keep pausing and unpausing the game. And now you can actually attack underwater just as you would on the surface, and you have this electric shield to kill any pesky fish that try to cheap shot you. Link's moveset has never been so diverse and it's all thanks to these masks. They take the gameplay to a whole new level, and there's so many smart uses for each of your abilities throughout the whole game. The level design takes great advantage of the fact that you have many tools at your disposal, and nowhere does that come across better than in the game's dungeons that, while few in number, are some of the most well thought out in the series. Majora's Mask is a much more challenging game than Ocarina of Time, which becomes noticeable when you reach its first dungeon, Woodfall Temple. It feels more complex than any of the Young Link dungeons from last time. You're expected to have mastered the Deku form by this point, and there's quite a few neat puzzles here that force you to think outside of the box. Puzzles of the type of caliber you'd only see in Ocarina's adult dungeons. This is also the dungeon where you get the bow, and the developers must have really loved the bow because you'll be using it a whole lot. Majora's Mask just does a really good job job of making you utilize all the items you acquire this time. There is one thing I hate about this dungeon though, the music. I legitimately think it's terrible. It's grating and gets old really fast. <laughs> I would really prefer if you would be quiet. Snowhead Temple is quite difficult your first time going through it, and I'm not just saying that because I clipped through the floor getting to the temple in my most recent playthrough. It's a lot like the Ice Palace from A Link to the Past, since you have to deal with ice physics and have an ass load of floors to explore, with your main goal being punching away the weak segments from this central pillar in the main room to make your way to the boss. I think it's a good dungeon overall, but man did it used to stump me. And I used to suck at using the Goron roll effectively, which forced me to backtrack to the floor I was on more times than I'd like to admit. Pro tip, if you ever fall in this place and want to save yourself the trouble of climbing up again, turn into Deku Link, touch the lava, and voila, you respawn back where you were. This is the dungeon where you get the fire arrows, and they bode well for the rest of the elemental arrows in the game, since you have to use them a lot to melt the ice blocking your path. They don't feel like an afterthought anymore. And the next dungeon on the list is the Great Bay Temple. The consensus is that this dungeon is even more confusing and difficult than the Water Temple, and is famously one of the 
the most hated dungeons in any Zelda game. I hated the Water Temple in the N64 version of Ocarina of Time because of the myriad of design choices that brought down the experience. In the 3DS version, I didn't love it but had a little more respect for its design thanks to the small improvements that were made and thought it was alright. So this may come as a shock, but I freaking love the Great Bay Temple. And it's not just because of how often you have to use the Zora form to complete it. Visually, I find it to be way more interesting than the Water Temple. And it also plays into why I'm such a fan of the level design in this place. Everything in this dungeon feels so meticulous. Instead of raising and lowering the water level, you have to reroute the flow of water in the dungeon to the central room. I honestly didn't get as lost here as I did in the Water Temple because the pipes along the walls do a good job of indicating where to go next. It certainly isn't a walk in the park, but I eventually made my way through the whole dungeon and felt super accomplished when I did. The ice arrows, the main dungeon item, are just the cherry on top. They have a new ability where they can create ice platforms out of bodies of water. The level of freedom the game gives you and how you build the way forward is so cool. Pun very much intended. Unfortunately, this reminds me of another change the 3DS version made that I don't like. They changed this mechanic to where you can only make ice platforms wherever the water is sparkling, leaving no room to experiment which is the opposite of cool. But let's go back to being positive. I also love these puzzles involving the spinning gears and scales that force you to use the fire and ice arrows to unfreeze and freeze the water currents. I probably wouldn't love it as much if I was playing the Japanese version though. I think this dungeon is genius and it would be my favorite in the game, but there's still one dungeon left. The Stone Tower Temple, disregarding the climb up to the temple which is very monotonous and boring, and the temple itself being home to the hardest stray fairy in the game to obtain, is absolutely magnificent. The way it makes you use all your mass transformations, the clever light puzzles, the music, and the gimmick that has you flipping the whole dungeon upside down, making you revisit rooms and explore them in a different orientation with the sky beneath your feet, I adore everything about this place. And the light arrows are the ultimate reward after a long and arduous journey, insta-killing almost every foe at the cost of being a real magic guzzler. Nothing a little Chateau Romani can't fix. See, this game even gives me a reason to use potions which I basically never do in any other Zelda game. Gosh, I love it. And I love these dungeons, each and every one of them. There may not be that many, but they're all such a treat to play through. Quality over quantity. And the addition of 15 stray fairies in each one of them adds another layer of challenge since now you have to carefully explore every inch of these dungeons to find them all. And getting every stray fairy to reassemble the great fairies is so worth it. The one in Woodfall grants you the upgraded spin attack. The one in Snowhead doubles your magic meter, which is such a good upgrade this time around since there's so many things in this game that use magic, the one in Great Bay doubles your defense when there's still a whole other region to explore, and the one in Ikana grants you the Great Fairy Sword, an excellent reward right before facing the final boss. If there's a sour spot that every dungeon shares, it would have to be the bosses which I mostly went over earlier. I wouldn't really call any of them great in any version of the game, but man I still can't get over how badly they f***ed up the Twin Wolf fight in the 3DS version. The final boss is definitely the best out of all of them, but I still think that it would have benefited from having more health because, as is, the fight just ends way too quickly. But to reach the final boss, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to bring your A game, cause like I said, the dungeons in Majora's Mask expect a lot out of you. And whether you like it or not, you're gonna have to complete them while the clock is constantly ticking. The Song of Time is your best friend in Majora's Mask. Hell, the Ocarina of Time itself is your best friend. It honestly feels more significant here than in the game that it was named after. At any point, you can play the Song of Time to reset the game's 3 day cycle. When you do so, any progress you made in dungeons or quests gets reset. Though thankfully, this doesn't mean that you have to redo any dungeons you've already finished or redo any concluded quest lines. Key items like boss remains, songs, and quest rewards stay in your inventory permanently, but consumable items like arrows and MacGuffins specific to a certain quest are lost. The challenge doesn't come from having to beat the entire game in one cycle or anything like that. It comes from how well you're able to manage your time, how good you are at keeping track of character schedules, and how much progress you're able to make before returning to the dawn of the first day. There's nothing quite as fulfilling as looking back at how much you were able to accomplish before playing the Song of Time. I'm the kind of guy who gets a kick out of optimizing my time as much as I can, being mindful of the clock and keeping events in the back of my mind to make my playthrough as efficient as I can make it. Even then, this is merely an optional challenge since you can play the game pretty much however you want. 
want. If you find the prospect of this kind of time management to be too overwhelming and complicated, there's nothing stopping you from playing it safe and only focusing on one or two objectives at a time. Playing this way may result in some repetitions and some quests only become available after meeting certain prerequisites that reset whenever you turn back the clock. The most time consuming examples I can think of are rematching the dungeon bosses to lift the curses on the regions of Termina. But again, it's all up to you how you decide to approach the adventure. There's still a sequence of events to follow and each dungeon has to be completed in the order I went through, but you're still given lots of freedom in how you plan out the side quest routing, making subsequent playthroughs something to look forward to as you'll now be able to further optimize your schedule if you so please. Like I said, this is how I personally prefer playing the game, minimizing the amount of times I have to play the Song of Time. Of course, this assumes that you'd actually want to do the side quests, because if you don't, managing your time isn't that hard to do. I've already talked about why I think it's in everyone's best interest to complete as many as they can, but even though my favorite way to play Majora's Mask is to do everything there is to do, it's not exactly smooth sailing either. The process of 100%ing the game involves playing a crap ton of minigames and lots of other side activities. Some of these are pretty fun. The Gold Sculptula Hunt from Ocarina of Time returns, now in a much more condensed format via the two spider houses that I really enjoy exploring. The Keton Quiz is neat but also really hard if you haven't been paying attention to some of the smaller details around the world. The Deku Playground and Beaver Race are entertaining minigames that test your mastery of the Deku form and Zora form respectively. The minigame revolving around the Goron form, the Goron Racetrack, is really frustrating though. The other Gorons have pretty obnoxious rubber band AI and can sneak up on you at the last minute, stealing your victory right from under your nose. They also don't know the concept of personal space as they like to run into you and knock you out of your role, causing you to lose precious time. It kind of sucks, and in my experience, it doesn't seem like it was improved much in the 3DS version. I've noticed this game is really obsessed with archery minigames, and here's where I'll say that playing with the N64 controller, specifically its analog stick, wasn't a very pleasant experience. These minigames are manageable after a couple of tries, I suppose, but the Octorok Shooting Gallery is one of the strictest minigames I've played in any of these games. Even with gyro aiming on the 3DS, I can just barely shoot all the Octoroks before they go away. You also have to do it twice to get both rewards. When you finally do get a perfect score, you'll have become the Hylian Sniper from how many times you'll have had to retry this minigame to the point where you've mastered it. But even this doesn't compare to the Doggy Racetrack. This one's just bad, there's no skill or fun involved whatsoever. Using the Mask of Truth to see the dog's level of motivation does increase your chances at placing high and getting the piece of heart, but every now and then you'll just get really shitty luck and end up wasting a bunch of rupees here. Watch this episode of Chugga Conroy's Let's Play if you don't believe me. There's other parts of the 100% journey I'm not a big fan of, like it's pretty much impossible to avoid refighting some of the bosses to finish quests that you may not have been able to complete earlier for whatever reason. It would have been nice if there was an option to refight them at half health or something to speed up the process. The game also recycles some of its content a bit too much. There are a lot of mini bosses in this game, and a lot of them have really cool designs and are unique encounters in their respective dungeons, but then you have some like Gecko, whose models are just reused in later areas. Dino foes come back pretty often, and they're just as pathetic as your first encounter with one. And then there's Wizrobe, who you fight five times if you 100% the game. Was this really necessary? Not enough differences between counters to warrant this either. But when all is said and done, these are super minor blemishes in a game that I find to be pretty much perfect otherwise. Majora's Mask introduces so many small refinements that go a long way when added up as you play through it. Termina Field is leagues more interesting to me than Hyrule Field ever was. Termina itself is a little smaller than Ocarina's Hyrule, at least I feel like it is, but because of that, it's a lot more dense and rich with activities and secrets at every turn. When I'd find rupees in underground holes or treasure chests in Ocarina of Time, it usually made me groan because there isn't much of a need for rupees in that game. In Majora's Mask, I love being showered with rupees. So many things in this game cost money and a lot of it. One of the pieces of heart is obtained from having 5,000 rupees deposited in the bank run by this time traveling banker. Rupees are plentiful though, but still scarce enough to where reaching this goal is still a challenge. Unless you know about this efficient money making technique, in which case this side quest is a near non issue. You can even get the adult's wallet as early as the first three day cycle, which goes to show how big of a role rupees have this time around. The Song of Soaring simplifies 
simplifies all the warp songs from Ocarina of Time by replacing them with just one song that allows you to warp to any of the owl statues you've activated. The game looks so good. Both versions of the game do. And I'm constantly on the fence of whether I prefer this game's soundtrack or Ocarina's. Ocarina definitely has the more iconic score, but the highs of Majora's music just hit different. The Observatory, Termina Field, the variations of the overworld theme when the land is cursed. I love all of the new Ocarina songs like the Sonata of Awakening and New Wave Bossa Nova. And now that I brought it up, the Ocarina is more fun to use now that the mass transformations bring new instruments to try out. Stone Tower Temple, on top of being my favorite dungeon in the game, also has my favorite dungeon theme, both the right side up and upside down versions. The Song of Healing, basically the game's headlining song, is beautiful. It's so soothing while still having that hint of eeriness that characterizes Majora's Mask as a whole. And I have to talk about Clock Town's theme. There's a different rendition of the tune during each day, and it progressively gets more fast and unsettling. Like it still sounds cheery on the third day, but the shift in tempo and inclusion of an ominous instrument in the background really conveys the oh sh feeling of this being the final day of the world. It's disorienting and panic-inducing in a way, and nothing conveys this feeling of despair quite like the song that plays during the final hours. Like the Song of Healing, it manages to be both beautiful and chilling, complementing the emptiness of the town now that most of its residents have fled to seek shelter, with the few that remain either being too stubborn to accept the horror of the situation playing out right above them, or have simply accepted their fates and are at peace knowing that these are their last moments in this world. It's damn impressive that an N64 game is able to depict an end of the world scenario with such an such a mature understanding of human nature. Sure, some of us will remain pieces of shit until we draw our last breaths, but a part of me would like to believe that most of us would instinctively turn to family and loved ones to feel some sense of comfort in our last moments. That some of us would even go to great lengths to fulfill kept promises right before the end. Because when it comes down to it, Kindness and love prevail even amidst the cruel darkness of the night. This game shows this to be true. A lot of people like describing Majora's Mask as depressing, but I prefer the word hopeful. So let's join Link and do something about the moon so that these characters, no, these people can continue living. So we can all greet the morning together. Playing the Oath to Order at the top of the clock tower just before the moon crashes calls the four giants you freed to the center of clock town. Together, they successfully halt the moon's descent, but Majora's Mask detaches itself from the Skull Kid, revealing itself to be its own entity that's been using the young imp as a puppet. It takes control of the moon and pushes back against the giant's efforts to hold it in place. Without a moment to spare, Link and Tattle step into the beam of light and end up in the moon for the final showdown. If this game didn't weird you out already, which would really be surprising if that was the case, then this will surely do it. Fire! The inside of the moon is a lush, grassy field with a lone tree on a hill, with kids running around who all bear a striking resemblance to the happy mask salesmen, wearing masks of the bosses you faced, talking to them, conquering their mini dungeons, and giving up all of the masks you've acquired prompts the lonely child wearing Majora's mask to give you the fierce deity's mask, the most powerful mask in the game that can only be used in boss rooms and the fishing hole in the 3DS version for some reason. Fierce Deity Link's voice sounds exactly like a 
Adult Link did in Ocarina of Time, a remnant of the cut Adult Link mask that was supposed to appear in this game. The fierce deity is an ancient hero of the land of Termina, who may have had a hand in sealing the demon known as Majora in the mask we see in the game. Majora itself is never given much backstory. They are evil just for the sake of it, but to an even greater degree than, say, Ganon, as Majora solely yearns for the destruction of the world. They're one of the more disturbing villains in the franchise, as it seems to actively get a kick out of the suffering it causes, and appears to have deluded itself into thinking that they're the good guy in the story based on how it labels you, or rather, the fierce deity, as the bad guy. Or does this mean that the fierce deity wasn't a hero and was actually more evil than Majora? Man, I love this game's lore. It's fun to think about. But enough about fan theories. After three phases of fighting and whatever the f this is, Link finally defeats Majora, sending the moon back to where it belongs and dispelling the evil that was contained in Majora's mask. The Skull Kid reconciles with his old friends and makes a comment that Link has the same smell as the fairy boy with the ocarina he met in the forest back then, confirming that this is the Skull Kid that Link met in Hyrule. It's just now he looks less… offensive? The happy mask salesman thanks Link for getting Majora's mask back and disappears into thin air. Okay, what the f***? He didn't try to hide that at all, just who the hell is he? Finally, Tattle says her goodbyes to Link before he leaves to continue his search for Navi. And the people of Termina happily celebrate the carnival of time and the dawn of a new day. At least, most of them do. So, is it any question which of the two N64 Zelda games I prefer? Ocarina of Time definitely makes me feel the most nostalgic, and I find it a little easier to replay with its more familiar setup, but ever since I first rolled the credits on Majora's Mask, I've considered it to be my favorite of the two in nearly every conceivable way. I love the darker tone and visuals and its more melancholy soundtrack. I love Link's arsenal and the mass transformations. I love the dungeons to bits and the whole time loop mechanic. I love Termina both in its creatively designed areas and the variety of activities there are to do in it. And I love the more personal story and how it engages you through its colorful cast of relatable characters. I'm hesitant in outright labeling Majora's Mask as my favorite 3D Zelda game since I'd still like to wait until I re-experience Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, games that I've also held in high regard for years before coming to a conclusion. But I can confidently say that no other Zelda game reaches Majora's level of intimacy and no other game in the series has managed to immerse me in the same way, besides Breath of the Wild I suppose, but for different reasons. And to think that this was made under a tight time constraint and that a good chunk of the game is made up of existing assets, just smartly recontextualized to fit into the new experience Aonuma and the team wanted to create. They really captured lightning in a bottle with Majora's Mask, accomplishing so much with so little. There probably won't ever be another Zelda game like it, but I'm okay with that. Let it be its own thing. This weird, creepy, brilliant gem. So with that said, may the wind guide us towards a new adventure. Thanks for watching.